Good evening. My name is Seth Norton. I'm the director of the J. Dennis Hastert Center for Economics, Government, and Public Policy at Wheaton College. Welcome to this event. This program tonight is dealing with the question, is economic growth moral? That topic embraces the core of modern economic theory and evidence, as well as biblical perspectives on the material world and the persistent prescriptions against the perils of materialism and the inherent impossibility of simultaneously serving God and money. Our speaker for this event is Stephen Smith, professor of economics at Gordon College. Stephen is a Phi Beta Kappa graduate of Williams College, cum laude as well, and holds a PhD degree in economics from Stanford University. Stephen has research experience at the World Bank and the Brookings Institution. He has published widely in international economics. He has co-authored a recent book, Human Flourishing, the Moral and Economic Case for Economic Growth, and co-edited a book entitled Attacking Poverty in the Developing World. In addition, Stephen is the co-editor of the scholarly journal Faith and Economics. After Stephen's address, you will be able to submit questions for Stephen's response. The forms are located on the seats and we will distribute those later. Prior to the audience discussion, your audience discussion, and while you are submitting the forms, we will have some comments from Wheaton alumnus Greg Lane and Wheaton faculty member Amy Reynolds. Greg Lane is a 2008 graduate of Wheaton College where he excelled in cross country and track. Greg is currently working for the American Enterprise Institute, where he's part of the Values and Capitals Initiative. Amy Reynolds is a graduate of Harvard University and holds a PhD in sociology from Princeton University. Her dissertation from Princeton, completed in 2010, is entitled, Saving the Market, the Role of Values, Authority, and Networks in International Trade Discourse. Dr. Reynolds is currently Assistant Professor of Sociology at Wheaton College. We look forward to Greg and Amy's comments and questions and reflections, as well as yours. In the meantime, let the discourse begin. Let's give a warm Wheaton welcome to Stephen Smith. Thank you so much, people, for uh, honoring me with this invitation and for being here tonight to uh, uh, take part in this uh, event. Before we go any further, I want to thank uh, Professor Norton and uh, uh, Dean Chapel and the, the staff at the Hastert Center for uh, hosting me so warmly and so, so well, uh, which I really appreciate. I also want to uh, take a minute and uh, acknowledge that uh, much of what I'm going to talk about tonight is coming from, is drawn from the recent book that Professor Norton mentioned, uh, uh, published by AEI Press, which I co-authored with Ed Knoll of Westmont College and my colleague from Gordon, Bruce Webb. And I particularly and gratefully want to acknowledge the generous financial support of AEI and actually the uh, CCCU, the Christian uh, colleges, uh, Coalition of Christian Colleges and Universities uh, in providing uh, for that work. Twenty-five years ago, the Nobel-winning economist Robert Lucas started writing and thinking about economic growth. He had won his Nobel for monetary theory so this marked quite a change in, in, in pace for him. And he remarked quite famously that, quote, the consequences for human welfare involved in questions like these, meaning about growth, are simply staggering. Once one starts to think about them, it's hard to think about anything else. I have lived that comment 
Growth is something I've been thinking about for almost my entire life, starting from when I was a kid knocking around Hong Kong Harbor. Yeah, that place. For many years, I crossed that harbor every day uh, going to and from school. I particularly enjoyed it when the ferry I was on would go close to uh, the freighters that were moored in the harbor, and I could literally see international trade taking place in front of, in, in front of me, and I think that's one of the reasons I became an international uh, economist. But what I also saw every day in Hong Kong was how economic uh, growth, which I could see happening around me, and which at times I could smell happening when the acetylene torches were cutting through iron to build skyscrapers. Um, I could see that process transforming uh, Hong Kong into the great city that many of us uh, now know. The city whose skyline is, uh, looks, like, looks like that and uh, represents one of the great cities of the, of the world. Even to my adolescent sensibilities, it was clear to me that parts of Asia were doing really well. People, actual persons that I knew, were palpably better off in 1975 compared to how they had been in 1965. They were living in solid apartments with plumbing and electricity instead of living in packing crates by the side of the road or in rickety shanties and squatter areas. It was also clear to me that other parts of Asia actually weren't uh, doing very well. I have uh, vivid memories as a, uh, as a child of seeing the starving refugees flooding into Hong Kong from mainland China during the Great Famine in the South that killed tens of millions of people in the, uh, in the aftermath of the so-called uh, Great Leap Forward. Did things have to be this way? What explained the difference between the two kinds of trajectories that I saw all around me uh, in Asia? One headed towards prosperity and the other towards uh, really uh, misery. Was this fate or was this human agency? Well, in studying economics, I realized, as many of us understand, that economic growth is what marks the boundary between wealth and human flourishing on the one side, and poverty and degradation on the other. It's the process that transforms societies from dire poverty to prosperity and to material well-being. It's brought billions of people out of poverty and holds the promise of sustaining even higher levels of, uh, of human flourishing if it can continue. Now, understanding growth is in part a question of understanding the economics of growth, but because growth is foundational to uh, material well-being, it's also fundamentally a moral issue. People who care about human well-being and who care about the poor should promote growth. Devising policies to promote and sustain growth in rich and poor countries alike is, I'm going to argue, uh, a moral imperative. So as you can tell, I'm not being coy at all about my answer to the question po posed in the title of today's presentation. Yes, absolutely, economic growth is a moral good. Uh, but, but the idea of growth has fallen on hard times in recent years. Growth's promise is as big as ever, but it's got problems. Its moral and economic dimensions are complex and easily misunderstood. It's got many critics, critics who deem it uh, a moral negative at best and at worst downright destructive. Without a strong vision of growth's moral legitimacy, societies might give up on its benefits. And I'll argue that growth is essential for human flourishing and is morally worthy of being a core aim of economic policy in uh, not just poor countries, but in rich countries. Now, uh, in the argument that follows, I make it in two broad parts. First, I want to take you on a, on a guided tour, a selected tour, of growth's deep promise and its current problems. Second, I want to offer and defend 
several moral propositions about, about growth to help our thinking. And I trust, in the course of talking about these, these four propositions, I trust, I, hope, I, I trust that I provoke you in the best way. Um, I provoke uh, your intellects and your consciences uh, to see growth properly and to uh, engage your Christian moral imaginations uh, in, in, in good ways. Now, through all my remarks tonight, I'm very much going to be taking the, uh, what I would call the, the long view. As, as important as some extra growth might be, this week, this month for our country, uh, for Illinois, um, as important as that might be, uh, what's at stake and what I want to talk about today are the attitudes and policies that will shape growth for years to come. So here we go. Growth's promise and its current problems. Now I need to define terms. So let's just take a minute and, and do this. For economists, uh, the phrase economic growth means something really specific, and uh, namely, it means a sustained increase in an economy's overall output of goods and services, often referred to as GDP, um, and understood uh, per person on a per capita basis. That's often called a country's standard of living. Now, the very act of producing goods and services generates payments of, of income to uh, the people who own capital and the people who work. So the value of a nation's output basically equals the value of the incomes earned uh, by residents of a country. Thus, when people use the terms uh, income or output interchangeably, that's actually usually all right. Uh, because if, if GDP if output per person rises, typically average incomes are also rising. So we'll go with this uh, definition. Now, I'm going to skirt all kinds of accounting issues here, uh, uh, and I'm also going to skirt some very well-known problems with uh, using a GDP per person to, to measure uh, material well-being, because it doesn't quite exactly get it right all the time, and we could talk about that. But for today, I'm going to take it as given that the best way, the best single yardstick available for measuring economic growth is output per person. Its, its great strength is that it captures the fundamental availability of goods and services and of income to spend on goods and services. A country with a GDP per person of $10,000 has fundamentally more ability to provide goods and services to its citizens than, than one with a GDP of $2,000 per person. Everything else being equal, people living in, in the first country will have more access to housing, healthcare, education, and all the opportunities that those resources provide. And if a country is growing at 3%, per person per year, it will, over time, have more goods and services available than one growing at 1% uh, per year per person. And I, I want to be careful here because uh, some poor countries are actually able to do a lot with their, uh, with their meager resources. Some poor countries do a much better job uh, educating their populations than do other poor countries with similar income levels. And so those are, at times, really important questions. But across the board, Bigger GDP means that a country can do more to provide the whole range of goods and services that contribute to uh, human uh, well-being. Now, now, the evidence of this is, is just uh, vivid and, and bright. GDP per capita is very strongly correlated with virtually every important indicator of human development. Name one, female literacy. Longevity, reductions in infant mortality, reductions in poverty, environmental regulation, higher education. Name your, me name your measure. GDP per capita and growth in GDP per capita are strong predictors of progress. For instance, just to pick one almost at random, the, the correlation between GDP per capita and reductions in the under five mortality rate uh, uh, is, is a positive correlation coefficient of 0.87, eye-poppingly large and highly statistically significant. Um, 
So the point is that with higher output and income, people and governments make and buy more of all of these good things. These things that are in, in fact human, that, that, that in fact constitute human development. Now, we, we in the contemporary West are the heirs of a burst of growth that started very slowly around uh, AD uh, 1000, accelerated just a little bit from 1500 to 1750, and then leapt upwards uh, with the Industrial Revolution. And so we see a dramatic acceleration, particularly after around uh, 1800 or 1820. Going back to 1000 AD, uh, the world's average income at that time, uh, we, as best it can be figured, uh, appears to have been around $700 per person expressed in current uh, currency terms. Practically speaking, uh, that didn't uh, mean that people were living terribly well. Uh, of course, modern conveniences, electronic uh, global communications, vivid entertainment, rapid transportation, all that gone, of course. Homes were dark and cramped, dirt floors, smoky interiors uh, were standard. William Manchester, uh, the historian, uh, uh, coined a phrase that describes that well. It was a world lit only by fire. Light after sundown was precious and very hard to come by. Literacy was unusual. Who could afford to educate a, a child? Secondary schooling was unimaginable. What family? could afford to give up an adolescent's time and work, even if such a thing as secondary education existed. And those deprivations were but the tip of things. The deeper issues were physical. Life was grueling, painful, full of very hard labor, nothing but the roughest medical care, all compounded by the slimmest margin of protection against the weather. Now, over the next eight centuries, up to roughly 1800, the growth rate in income was 0.05% per year. Not 5%, 0.05, a 20th of a percent per year. At that kind of imperceptible growth rate, changes from year to year, even from decade to decade, uh, couldn't be noticed. Um, but growth in Western Europe ticked up at a slightly higher rate, around 0.13% per year until 1500, and then a tick higher again, 0.15% uh, per year through 1820, was still really low. But uh, if we pause the clock at 18, 1820, uh, average incomes in the world as a whole were around $1,000, and income in Europe had risen all the way up to $2,000 per person per year, again, in current uh, money terms. And of course, it was from the early 1800s onward that the rate of economic growth accelerated dramatically, uh, above 1.5%, close to 2% sometimes, even a little higher sometimes in, in, in Europe and the United States. And it's that explosion in, in growth uh, that, that took our average incomes in the US from around $2,000 in 1820 uh, per person up to about $50,000 now uh, in, in 2010. Those stupendous increases in incomes drove the dramatic improvements in physical and material well-being that we modern citizens take entirely uh, for granted. And we take them so much for granted, I want to take a minute with you and see if we can remind ourselves of how bad things were, not a thousand years ago, but but just less than, less than 200 years ago, back in, back, in 18, back in 1820. Because this growth has had profound consequences. I, I, you know, I'm not sure if you can see necessarily all the uh, labels on, these, uh, on this graph, but you actually don't need to, to make sense of this. This is information on infant mortality rates. And infant mortality is measured as the number of children who die before their first birthday per 1,000 children. It's information here on, on the bar chart for Japan, for France, and the United Kingdom. Actually, Japan is the leftmost column, the UK is the middle, and France is on the, on the right. And do you, see at the, do you see 
the little kind of blurry red smudges at the bottom of the, of the graph that are barely registering, that's, that's infant mortality rates in those countries now. Three per thousand, four per thousand, five per thousand. Look how big they were previously. 250 in Japan, Un unimaginably big by our, by our current standards. 180 or so in France, 144 in, uh, in the UK. So the point here is that uh, for all the ease with which we live in, 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 in our current wealth, uh, it really does represent a, a stupendous improvement over, over how uh, even recently alive generations uh, lived. Now, interestingly, uh, for all of economic growth's profound consequences, formal economic theory has really struggled to make sense of it. E economists, uh, if they ask the question, what are the sources of growth, um, economists know in the broadest possible terms that something like half, 50% of the growth experienced in the 20, uh, 20th century uh, can be attributed to the accumulation of capital goods and uh, education, which economists often call human capital. And, and what that means is we can make more goods and services and produce more, more things and enjoy higher incomes because we have more tools to work with and we're better educated, we're better at using them. The remaining half of of, uh, of, the, of output growth uh, in the 20th century is, is roughly speaking attributable to technological improvement and that is uh, to creatively figuring out how to get more output from the same amount of capital and labor uh, or creatively figuring out uh, new kinds of goods and services to make. Pure mathematical economic theory has, has a hard time modeling all of this and, and actually that doesn't really have much to offer policymakers by way of specific policy recommendations. The, uh, the famous international economist Elhanan Helpman, who's written extensively about growth, calls, calls this, as he should, uh, the mystery of, of growth, at least in terms of formal mathematical modeling. But we do know something about the kinds of institutions that promote investment and, gro and growth of the uh, excuse me, that promote investment in and growth of the capital stock. We do know something about the institutions that promote education and which encourage technological uh, innovation. They are the institutions, broadly speaking, of the market economy. A system of private property rights, legally enforceable, the rule of law, a financial system that can channel savings to promising new investments, institutions and social norms that support specialization and exchange, and at least, to some extent, uh, a free press. Growth can occur temporarily for a season in authoritarian and state-directed governments, uh, especially if they're poor and if they can play a kind of catch-up game, a technological catch-up with, with advanced countries. But for sustained growth over the long haul, nothing beats uh, a market economy with the rule of law. So that's growth's promise. Sustained improvement in material well-being. Achievable through well-known institutions. In principle, relatively easily adoptable. And you don't even need all of them to get growth started. So what could go wrong? How in the world could growth have a bad reputation? What could possibly uh, be amiss here? Well. Uh, the truth is, as you know, growth is mired in, in all kinds of, of bad press. So let me take a second and catalog those, uh, tore you through those, uh, those problems. Uh, the first is that growth is, growth is really slowing down. If uh, you uh, look at the data for the U.S., and I think that's my next slide, yeah, there we go. In the United States, growth per person has definitely slowed in the, in the last uh, 50 years. These are average annual growth rates in real GDP by decade. Uh, the first bar on the left is the 60s. Growth was around 3% per person per year, and it's been downhill since then, and as you can see, dramatically downhill. And, and things would look even worse if we graphed the last five years there on the, on the right-hand side of the, uh, uh, of the graph. 
trend is similar in Japan and, and Europe. Now, countries on the leading technological edge, like the United States, do tend to grow more slowly than countries engaged in catch-up growth, like China. But a decline in our growth rate is another matter. And the question is, is, is that something that's happening for deep structural reasons that are, are not amenable to uh, policy action? Growth in some of the fast-growing poorer countries is also slowing down a little bit. Is that too for deep structural reasons that policy can't uh, affect? A number of observers actually uh, answer that uh, affirmatively. And so the slowdown in growth poses some substantial policy challenges and uh, represents an important area for ongoing, ongoing work. Second, there's a widespread view uh, that in the past 60 years, the uh, global economic growth culminating in the globalizing era of the past uh, 30 years hasn't helped the poor or poor countries in general. I could choose so many examples of this because so many authors write almost reflexively that the global economy, uh, or rather in the global economy, quote, uh, there has been a marked increase in global inequalities of, of income and wealth, unquote. That particular quote is from Anne Pettifor, but it could just as easily have been uh, taken from theologian uh, Steve Buma Prediger or, or any number of commentators on, on, uh, on modern economic growth. There are literally thousands of places this uh, sentiment has been uh, expressed. And then, of course, there's the uh, third, uh, the radical environmental critique that economic growth is physically and biologically unsustainable. Resources will be exhausted. Catastrophic climate change is upon us. Population growth sustained by economic growth is a planetary burden and so on. This is a, a, the, the modern face of, of, of Malthusianism, uh, neo-Malthusianism. There's also a, a powerful satiation argument. Uh, is growth really important for wealthy societies? Aren't we, in fact, rich enough? Growth might still be important for poor countries, but haven't we reached a reasonable stopping point? This particular critique has found a lot of favor with Christian thinkers. And in this view, being committed to the idea of economic growth is, is like an unwise commitment to grasping materialism at best and, and could be sheer mammon-worshipping idolatry uh, at worst. It's greedy, it's selfish, it's wrong. Now, if, if these problems were all uh, fatal, or if these charges were all uh, true, uh, growth uh, would indeed be uh, problematic. And I don't actually think that uh, these problems are as big as these, uh, as these critiques uh, suggest. Um, but the sharpness of these critiques and their prominence around us tells us that growth has a truly a profound image problem right now. If it was a stock listed on the New York Stock Exchange, it'd be trading at historic lows. If it was a brand, it would be pulled for rebranding and retooling. But since growth is a moral matter, I think what it needs is a moral reevaluation. And so, in the remainder of my remarks, I make the case for the, for the following uh, four uh, moral propositions. First, if you care about the poor, you should care about promoting growth. Let me lay, let me lay out all four for you uh, to provoke you, and then I'll go through these uh, in, in turn and, and speak a little bit about each of them. If you care about the earth and restoring creation, you should care about promoting growth. If you care about treating future generations fairly, you should care about promoting growth. And if you care about spiritual well-being and understanding that we are beings uh, and, and excuse me, and you understand that we are beings made in our creator's image, you should care about promoting growth. So let me begin uh, with uh, growth and poverty. Uh, not, notwithstanding what, uh, what a lot of uh, current critics uh, allege, the current globalized era uh, of economic growth is one of what I think really can only be described as massive poverty reduction, driven in large part by 
uh, widespread growth. The World Bank data on this is just, is just compelling, and I urge any of you interested in this to, uh, to go online and, and look at it for, your, for yourselves. It's, it's uh, available for free now uh, uh, on the World Bank's uh, data site, which is easily uh, accessible. If we look at poverty in terms of the, the well-known uh, criterion of uh, uh, the, the, the percent of a population, the share of a population that's living on a dollar uh, a day or, or less. Here's what's been happening in the last 30 years. And again, if, if you can't see all the details in this graph, that's, uh, that's okay. The graph tells the, tells the story. Um, on, the, uh, on the vertical axis are, are, are poverty rates. Uh, the top of the axis there is 80% poverty. Um, the horizontal axis is, is years, and they span, the data spans basically 1981 through uh, 2008, so roughly three decades. China leads the pack. China's the bluish gray line, the steeply descending line. It's the country whose poverty in the past 30 years has declined from around 75% down to less than 10%. Just, uh, just a, a stupendous, astonishing um, a reduction in, in poverty that precisely corresponds with its high growth era and the economic reforms that began in the late 70s and early 80s. South Asia is, is the, the orangey line that's uh, moving straight down from, let me see if I can, uh, it's, 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 it's that line there. The, sorry, this is a little hard to point to. It's the straightish line that's uh, kind of an orange color. Um, uh, poverty rates moved from the mid 40% range down into the, into the low teens. Uh, uh, over the past 30 years, uh, in, including um, a, a substantial drop in poverty after, China, after India's economic reforms began in 1991. Sub-Saharan Africa and Latin America, they are the regions, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa is the, is the green line at the, at the top, Latin America is the uh, line at the bottom. Uh, after poverty actually rose in those regions uh, in the decade after 1980, uh, in large part probably due to the difficulties of, of, of structural adjustment and, and di digesting their, their, their policy issues uh, fr from the, from the uh, post -colonial, immediate post-colonial era. Um, uh, once growth resumed in those, in those regions, we, uh, after the early 90s, we also see poverty reductions there. And all that adds up to a substantial global poverty reduction in this, in this entire period. What, one of the things that this, this graph reflects is that uh, the absolute income of the poor almost always rises with economic growth. And uh, the other thing that pops out here is that growth isn't a, isn't a seesaw. One, country, one country's gains in poverty reduction aren't coming at the expense of another country. Uh, everybody's uh, doing better. And so, and so uh, I... I, I urge us to consider this point. If you care about reducing poverty, you should care about promoting economic growth. Now, let's turn to growth in the environment. There can be no question that aspects of economic growth are bad for the environment. Uh, that's, that's plain for everyone to see. Uh, new factories emit pollutants, new cars create smog. What's, what's harder to see, but essential for properly assessing growth and policy choices, is that Poverty also is really bad for the environment. The poorer the population, in general, the less it will care for environmental protection and the more willing it will be to trade off long-term environmental quality for short-term economic gain. This is one of the many reasons poverty is not consistent with human flourishing. Income growth changes that equation. Almost immediately, in the first initial stages of income growth, societies are willing to pay to eliminate some kinds of pollution. Septic, septic and sewage systems get built. Natural gas replaces cow patties as the fuel of choice for heating your home and for cooking your food. This means that some kinds of pollution improve immediately with growth. Longer term, as societies gain income, they become more knowledgeable about and willing to engage in more expensive kinds of pollution control. Free democratic societies 
very, very much, of course, desirable in their own right, let me emphasize, are particularly good in this respect. They allow citizens to give voice to environmental concerns and to debate and to adopt all kinds of appropriate environmental regulation. That's why there's been so much progress uh, against pollutants in the US, the EU, and Japan. Uh, and I might add, this process is helped considerably when property rights are protected in law because it, that facilitates private negotiation as a pretty sure path uh, towards environmental remediation. Uh, in, in describing this process of richer countries being more willing to, to clean up the environment, uh, students in the audience may recognize that I'm uh, talking about the uh, environmental Kuznets curve. This particular mechanism works far less reliably in authoritarian systems. Authoritarian systems can sometimes act quickly to enforce rules. And perhaps uh, you're familiar with uh, the, uh, the New York Times, Thomas Friedman's gl glowing uh, praise of China's partial ban of plastic bags, something uh, we've struggled with in the, in the United States. Um, but more often, authoritarian societies uh, do not, in fact, pay sufficient heed to the public's desire for environmental regulation. And that is a big part of China's environmental problem right now. The good news about the environment is that when environmental problems are national in scope, they're amenable to national regulatory solutions. And while we can debate the pros and cons, the efficiencies, the inefficiencies of various kinds of, of regulations, the fact is that solutions are within reach and shouldn't stand in the way of growth-promoting policies. Likewise, uh, when environmental problems are international in scope, and this occurs particularly with common pool resource problems where there's the potential for the tragedy of the commons, these two can sometimes be settled easily by international negotiation. And a, a really good example of that is the uh, US, Thailand, and, and Mexico negotiations over dolphin safe tuna fishing. Um, the way tuna was traditionally uh, fished uh, had the potential to completely decimate uh, global dolphin uh, stocks, but negotiations amongst the largest uh, fishing nations um, easily, uh, relatively easily uh, resolved uh, that, that problem. As you know, global warming and global carbon emissions represent perhaps the biggest, most problematic environmental problem at present. Fiendishly difficult common pool resource problem. We don't know for sure the exact relationship between carbon and, and climate change. Uh, that relationship defies anything like uh, precise estimation. Uh, complicated by the fact that the uh, appropriate policy response is to, it would be to reduce all greenhouse gas emissions regardless of source. And, and since the US is neither the only emitter nor the largest emitter, uh, costly action on our part uh, will, will be ineffective unless it's matched by the rest of the world. What that means is that that uh, carbon emissions are not actually a growth problem. They're a political economy problem. They need to be addressed to the extent that we uh, think they need to be addressed. They need to be addressed carefully through global negotiations. So to sum this up, what I would say is that in the short term, growth in the environment may feel like substitutes for one another, uh, but uh, they're not as much substitutes for each other as it appears. And in the long term, they're complements. So I would say, if you care about the environment, you should care about promoting growth. Now, growth and future generations. Yeah, you know, we could talk for hours on this. I promise you I won't. 30 seconds on this one. Deficits, debt fiscal crises, unfunded liabilities, uh, from Illinois state pensions uh, to Social Security. Um, oh my goodness, the stage is set for intense contests and tension between generations, pitting young against old in a contest for funds and, uh, and resources. In that context, extra growth actually helps Two extra percentage points of growth in 2012 would have knocked $300 billion off of our 
federal government budget deficit. It would have knocked it from uh, $1.1 trillion down to uh, uh, $800 uh, billion, dollars, or, or 0.8 of a trillion. Okay, that's still big, uh, but that's a big difference. And so I would argue that growth has the potential to diffuse the antagonism between generations that might otherwise poison uh, national life uh, uh, here and ar around the world. So if you care about treating future generations fairly, you should care about promoting growth. So now let me turn to really what might be the, the, the biggest issue for, for, uh, for uh, contemporary Christians, and, and that is the, the wide range of, of, of critiques of growth, uh, sharp moral critiques of growth, uh, and also of market economic systems that promote growth that have emerged from Christian thinkers in recent years. This criticism has been mostly aimed at rich countries, and while at one level it, it can be summed up as, as arguing that we're, we're rich enough, we shouldn't worry about growth, uh, there's actually a, a lot more to it. And so uh, it's worth considering this moral criticism and ways to think about it uh, in considerable detail. There's several, several objections to, to growth here that, that fall under this category. One, one is that growth in rich countries distracts people uh, from addressing genuine social needs. When the rich desire a rising living standard, uh, they turn from the needs of the truly hungry. Uh, Kent, Velt, uh, Kent Van Til, the Christian philosopher, suggests that uh, as part of this line of thinking that the claims of the poor don't generate effective demand uh, in, that's recognized within the marketplace. So the poor don't have the ability to pay the price asked by the market, and so the market doesn't respond to their needs but only satisfies the wants of those with sufficient income. Second major objection uh, to, to growth is that individuals, excuse me, is that what individuals perceive to be uh, their economic needs are in fact socially constructed wants, stoked by advertising and by other means of selfish persuasion. From this point of view, the concept of scarcity itself, which economists take to be a fundamental problem for the social order to address, is actually a symptom of an improperly organized economic system. Trying to satisfy economic needs through economic growth, from this point of view, is, is therefore deeply problematic. Uh, the way theologian Douglas Meeks puts it is, growth should not be based on infinite needs and acquisition leading to ever-widening appropriation of nature. Uh, for the sake of accumulating wealth. And, and this is a widely shared critique. Theologian William Kavanaugh writes, quote, uh, the idea of scarcity assumes that the normal condition for the communication of goods is through trade. To get something, one must relinquish something else. The idea of scarcity implies that goods are not held in common, that the consumption of goods is essentially a private experience, close quote. So from this point of view, uh, the concept of scarcity itself is, is a contingent one, contingent on accepting the legitimacy of private property rights. Daniel Bell and others in the radical orthodoxy school uh, concur. For Bell, the notion of, of scarcity uh, is a, a means of avoiding the discipline of controlling our wants. Uh, and, and this is, a, this is a, a, an important theme. Economist Bob Houtsvard joins that uh, that chorus about scarcity and need, uh, contending that it's the, uh, the, the media that has, quote, commercially promoted explosion of human needs in our already rich societies, unquote, pushing them uh, beyond the level of their possible uh, satiation, or excuse me, saturation. Houtzvard offers a, a very fetching and a very striking metaphor uh, to, to think about this. He, he calls on modern societies to take a lesson from the tree, which by literally organic self-restraint ends its vertical growth at maturity. It uses its reserves to bear fruit and to produce seeds. Likewise, business firms, labor unions, consumers ought to practice cooperation out of a spirit of self-restraint and contentment without pursuing economic growth. 
There's also a, a third critique, uh, most prominently associated with Wendell Berry, uh, that growth harms local communities. His voice, in fact, is one of uh, many that allege that, that growth is very harmful for cultures, that it, that it destroys cultures. Uh, and a final critique uh, uh, is that many, uh, uh, many observers are dismayed at the intense short-run focus of much public uh, discussion about economics and, and growth. Uh, the fact that consumption uh, accounts for 70% of, of spending, uh, according to this uh, line of critique, uh, is evidence that short-sighted, debt-financed binging today is, uh, is occurring rather than prudential savings for the future. The way Jim Walls puts it, uh, it's, it's evidence of, of outright idolatry and, and mammon worship. I think all of these critiques have elements of truth. Uh, critics are right to fear uh, that a growing abundance of goods and services may lead individuals to place their trust in wealth. Christians should name such a tendency as idolatrous and challenge it. The critics are right to be concerned about how growth in the market economy affect values and morality. And they're right to value community. But I would argue that they miss crucial features of how economic life and morality truly affect one another. Most fundamentally, their views misjudge the full extent of the benefits of growth, benefits that can assist moral development. They also misattribute genuine moral problems such as materialism or lack of concern for the poor. They misattribute those to growth and to the market rather than thinking of them as inherent in free human communities. Thus, they fail to see that these problems are best countered by healthy culture and virtue rather than countered by slower growth. On, on this point, it is in fact, I think, worthwhile, um, um, excuse me, on this point, I think it is worthwhile enumerating specifically and in detail precisely how it is that rich countries experience real and substantial benefits from growth. It's not all about bigger TVs. Even a society where per capita income is already above $50,000 per year can benefit from more resources. There's no lack of good ends to which our society could apply billions of dollars of fresh resources that it actually can only get from growth. The fight against cancer and Alzheimer's requires expensive labs and skilled medical caregivers and researchers. The ongoing work to reduce pollution of all kinds requires research and investments. The ongoing challenge of providing good education through college or postgraduate study or vocational training requires resources and skilled personnel and capital. The ongoing improvements in travel that take international mobility and global understanding to new levels require substantial investments in infrastructure and use of capital. The ongoing creation of new products that meet real needs requires billions in research and development expenditures. Do we or do we not need better prosthetics? Do we or do we not need safer cars? Do we or do we not need cell phones? Uh, maybe don't answer that one. But in all seriousness, I don't think hardly any of us would be willing to give up uh, the internet and uh, the information revolution that that embodies. I would argue that these, in fact, are all uh, genuine needs, not mere wants. Uh, the meeting of these needs being a, a genuine good. And the fact that acquiring these goods requires investment of time, money, and effort means that scarcity is real, not imaginary. Producing these goods and services, whoops, excuse me, producing these goods and services opens up life-giving vocations for millions. And, and note too, obtaining these goods and services requires creativity, and an economic system that encourages innovation and the diffusion of new ideas. But 
does this uh, material prosperity provide any moral benefits? Is it all uh, about um, material well-being? Well, arguably, arguably yes. Uh, Adam Smith argued in The Wealth of Nations that uh, commercialization encourages improved moral character. Living standards rise where markets are allowed to expand. Uh, probity thrives and deceit is suppressed because the value of a good personal reputation and the rewards from being able to collaborate in business with people outside of one's family are so much bigger than before. The market also encourages virtuous habits such as planning for the future, taking responsibility for one's livelihood, um, thinking independently. And that argument is as relevant uh, today as it was in Smith's era. The fact that markets and growth promote probity, honesty, and the other commercial virtues, uh, though that term is not always meant as a compliment, uh, strikes critics as kind of a weak defense of, of markets. Shouldn't society want a more robust cultivation of virtue for its own sake? Yes. But neither should this feature of markets uh, be taken lightly. Alternative non-market or state-dominated systems likely to put much greater limits on economic liberty can't be expected really to do a better job of encouraging citizens to practice uh, the commercial virtues or other virtues as we uh, from the 20th century have lots of sad experience about. Other observers as well, more recent than Smith, have pointed to the uh, virtues that uh, markets cultivate. Francis Fukuyama uh, argues that, uh, that markets help cultivate social trust even as they depend on it uh, for their proper uh, functioning. Uh, most recently, Benjamin Friedman, the economic historian at Harvard, has uh, argued that economic growth leads to moral improvements by encouraging greater tolerance of others' economic su uh, uh, success by uh, making members of society uh, less tolerant of, of prejudices uh, that restrict opportunity and economic mobility. And, uh, and, 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 and Friedman argues that there's a very sharp contrast between what happens in growing economies as opposed to stagnant economies where uh, the latter would be plagued by harmful moral consequences uh, uh, when most people find their incomes falling, those individuals who do manage to get ahead are perceived not only as doing so at other people's expense, but as directly disadvantaging others, and suspicions rise, uh, and, and so on. Christian thinking, in addition, points to a number of positive moral aspects of economic growth. Positive aspects about markets, and positive aspects about the institutions which sustain them. They spring from, I would argue, the Christian view that the material world is fundamentally good, that humans are called to tend to the earth and keep it, and that humans are made in God's image, that is, in the image of a creator God. These beliefs imply that poverty is not God's desired state for humanity. Prosperity, honestly obtained, is good, though it should never um, be thought of as an expected benefit of faith. Material well-being that's the result of human creativity, investment, and work should be celebrated, not shunned, though wealth is never to be worshiped in place of God. Environmental stewardship and care for the earth are goods, but they're not the only goods. Though fallen due to sin, humans retain the image of God and thus have a kind of intrinsic goodness that makes them worthy of care too. Individuals have an inalienable dignity that requires institutions uh, uh, that res uh, requires institutions to respect their freedom of action and the legitimacy of their command over resources, even as those individuals are called to make wise decisions about their time, talents, and responsibilities. These are enduring foundations on which a healthy growth ethic can be built. And so the Christian worldview puts the material world into a very balanced perspective, neither wanting to be a slave to growth nor fearful of embracing it. Growth's critics, in their utopian denial of present scarcity, consistently undervalue the importance of unle unleashing humanity's godly creativity in economic life. I want to return to Houtzfard's metaphor of the tree knowing organically when to stop growing and functioning best at stable maturity. That is inadequate for thinking about a rich economy. 
A sense of sufficiency is excellent for individuals who are indeed wise to reject growth and who should follow their callings, whether those callings are lucrative or not. The wise teaching of scripture in Nehemiah 17, 7, 8 uh, of, uh, of you know, the tree planted by water, that, that should resound through the church, but it's not appropriate for a nation or an economy as a whole to cease growing. Indeed, far from being organic, cessation of growth for the entire human community would be unnatural. It would be the result of constraints on creativity, constraints on freedom, and constraints on the proper exercise of stewardship. Fortunately, growth in a market economy need not hinge on materialism. Uh, good economics dovetails with good morality here in a particularly helpful way. Uh, Short-sighted consumer behavior is worth critiquing. Neither markets nor economic growth require that people act in such a way. And the US economy's emphasis on consumption over savings in recent years uh, can easily be uh, redressed. Nor is there anything about economic growth per se that requires spending on tawdry consumption items rather than investing in productive assets like education and housing and valuable services like uh, healthcare. To sustain growth, growth needs to be held in mind consciously as a morally legitimate goal. For not aware of its value, it risks dying a death of a thousand cuts from the cumulative effect of small policy choices that erode it. National policies need to support and nurture the personal and civic virtues of truth-telling, public spiritedness, self-sacrifice, along with courage, love, and prudence. And so, I conclude, if you care about spiritual well-being and understand that humans are made in our Creator God's image, you should care about promoting growth. Lots of interesting things remain uh, unexplored to, uh, in, in my comments here. I think the stakes are high, uh, but I trust I've said uh, some sufficiently provocative things to uh, stimulate our, our panelists, and I look forward to your questions later. Thank you very much. If you have questions for Professor Smith, if you would be so kind as to fill out the cards by your seats, we will collect those and, and uh, present them to Professor Smith to discuss. In the meantime, Greg Lane and Amy Reynolds will come up and give a few questions and comments for Stephen. Thank you, Dr. Norton, and uh, thank you for the Hassler Center for hosting the event. Thank you for coming. Um, I just want to quickly plug the American Enterprise Institute, uh, in case you haven't heard of it. AEI is a nonprofit, nonpartisan think tank in Washington, D.C. Uh, we're dedicated to the research and education of issues dealing with government, politics, economics, and social welfare. Um, also, our Values and Capitalism project, which was started in 2009, uh, was started to explore the moral dimensions of free enterprise, particularly in partnership with Christian colleges. Uh, if you're interested in more, there's some information I left at the table. Also, for students, if you're interested in opportunities for internships, jobs, and um, other opportunities for um, employment at AEI, uh, I have some information at the table. Feel free to grab me afterwards. Um, Stephen, thank you for your comments and uh, for your remarks, and especially for your thoughtful consideration of the moral dimensions of economic growth. Um, it's really a topic we're interested in. And uh, your remarks actually made me think of a recent book by AEI's president, Arthur Brooks, uh, The Road to Freedom, um, where, among other things, he argues that the free enterprise system has done more good for the most vulnerable people than any other system. And he quotes a similar statistics to the graph you showed, where since 1970, the number of people living under a dollar a day has actually decreased by 80%. Um, he likes to argue that it's like the single greatest human accomplishment in human history. Um, but also, one of the things I learned in my time at Wheaton was that no system is perfect. I think it was in my comparable economics systems class that um, no system is perfect, they all have their drawbacks. And so it made me think to your remarks, I wanted to ask, uh, in terms of growth, not every form of growth is good. I've heard you say that before. And so I'm interested to ask you, what forms of growth are good and what forms are not? 
what times of forms, what forms of growth encourage commercial virtues, and what forms of growth actually unleash the potential for human flourishing. Thank you. I should address that now. I'm very happy to, you know. Um, and a very, fair, a very fair question, because in my remarks, I obviously emphasized the, uh, the, the, the higher qualities of, of growth and its desirability. You know, uh, for, for poor countries, uh, perhaps the easiest way to, to, uh, the easiest thing to point to that where, where, where growth is, is clearly problematic is, is when growth is uh, based on uh, natural resource sales and uh, the, the proceeds from those sales, the profits from those sales, are grabbed by an, an elite, used to pay off the military that keeps the elite in power, without generating much, if anything, for the uh, livelihoods of the, of the ordinary people in the country. Paul Collier, the distinguished uh, economist of, of Africa, former uh, uh, World Bank uh, economist who wrote the, the book, The Bottom Billion, many of you may have seen. Uh, he, he calls this the natural resource trap, and it, and it is a trap. Uh, some of these countries will experience uh, growth uh, in measured in, in, by the standard statistics. It'll look like national income is, is, is rising, uh, particularly if oil prices are rising and they're an oil exporter, or if uh, I, you know, uh, iron ore prices are rising and they're an iron ore exporter. Um, uh, uh, but, but what's really going on inside, the, inside those countries is, uh, is, is not sustainable and isn't laying a uh, foundation for, for long-term uh, long prosperity at, at all. Now, what's, uh, 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 that's a particularly sharp problem if, if the natural resource that's being exported isn't, say, um, something like coffee that's produced widely in, in the country uh, across lots of small farms, but is instead something that's produced, say, uh, oil uh, in a very narrow capital-intensive uh, 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 sector of the economy where there's relatively little employment, and so its, its benefits are tightly concentrated uh, to the few workers who, who, who work in, the, in, in, that, in that field. The government grabs the, the, the rent, pays off the military, and, and the country's in trouble, deep, deep trouble. You know, uh, the, 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 surprising, the surprising thing about growth in the poor is, is, that, is that it's actually hard to come up with examples, uh, or, or, many, or many examples, of countries where they've experienced growth and, and the poor haven't, haven't benefited. Um, th th those cases exist, uh, like in the natural resource trap cases I, I, just, I just mentioned. Um, even, if, even if the poor don't gain as much as the rest of the country, which sometimes, which sometimes happens, growth is, is still tends to, to, to raise the absolute uh, level of income of the, uh, of, of the poor. And so one of the things I can, to, to close my answer, I can say the, uh, growth that's, growth that's un unsustainable, growth, growth that's based on, on bubbles of various kinds, uh, uh, and, and, and therefore can't can't continue is is obviously problematic because the when the when the uh, when the bubble breaks the, uh, although there may have been benefits for society and for the poor up to that point there's a painful reckoning uh, and so it's actually uh, the macro stability and and steady growth is actually uh, really desirable rather than lots of lots of stop uh, stop and goes. So uh, where you ended is sort of where some of the questions and comments I have are coming from. Um, just also want to say I appreciate the opportunity to be here tonight. I think this question of how we think about issues of economic development, growth, um, and asking the moral questions about this is extremely important um, and something I don't think we do enough of. So I'm excited, too, to see the number of people in the audience uh, thinking about this. And really appreciate Stephen sort of providing this broad perspective to have us ask, what do we think you know, is moral? How do we as Christians live in a marketplace um, 
and that our, our economic decisions have moral consequences. So I guess one comment and uh, a question to end. This idea that growth is morally good and your, and your comments you just have seem to be premised on the idea that if the poor are benefiting absolutely, in an absolute sense from growth, then growth is economically good or is morally good and ethically good. And I guess I would say I find that somewhat problematic because the questions of how wealth is distributed and both how that well is gotten, where it comes from, um, it seems to me those, the, the question might be, how do we promote ethical growth, or when is growth ethical? Um, that, those are, that without the answers to those questions, it's hard to say that growth is moral. Um, and so let me just, you know, two examples. When I, when I think about absolute poverty, um, you know, as sociologists, for example, we would often say relative poverty is just as important. So if you're saying, you know, um, the poor, you know, absolutely their poverty rises in a country, but most of the wealth accrues to the wealthy, what does that mean about the fact that maybe their relative poverty has increased, right? Their, their isolation. So sociologists tell us that now it's more likely that the poor live with other poor and in more social isolation, um, and the wealthy also in sort of these bubbles. Um, and so, you know, our relative poverty, that determines how we can participate in society, right? You mentioned cell phones. We might not think of that as a need, but what does it mean if we don't have access, the poor don't have access to the same sort of uh, communication systems and these sorts of things? So, um, yeah, I guess the questions to me of poverty and inequality seem connected because that relative poverty is hard to separate from absolute poverty. Uh, well, I would still agree with you that it's really impressive looking at the gains in absolute poverty, right, that we have. Um, and I guess second, a question that, that did not come up as much and maybe uh, you address in other places is thinking about how that wealth is gained. So just now you were talking about resource extraction and some of the problems where wealth comes up. Um, but it seems like part of the unequal distribution we have in terms of how wealth gets distributed is because of the power that different actors have in the market. So poor have less bargaining power in the markets, right? They have less access to capital often. They're taking what is offered. Um, and you use this phrase, unleashing people's creative activity, which I really liked. Um, and it seems to me a purpose of growth should be how do we make sure we're unleashing that creative activity for the poor just as much that it's not the wealthy who are able to unleash that activity. What does it mean to make sure that um, the poor have more access to participate on the market. Um, so there, there's an economist, Danny Roderick, for example, when he talks about economic globalization and how business actors and um, all these people can cross state lines now in an era of economic globalization, right? The poor still don't have that ability. We know that from uh, immigration debates raging not just in the United States, but plenty of other countries. Uh, so what does it mean, I guess, to give the poor more power within that market uh, when we come to growth? And we, we, would those questions be important, too, if the growth is morally good? Um, I know that's a lot, but I guess a, a second question I wondered is, you mentioned this idea of human flourishing and individual well-being as values which Christians should affirm. Um, and I would agree with you, right, that as Christians, uh, we want to affirm human flourishing. Uh, but I wondered why would we say individual well-being we're looking at as the highest goal, and wondered what you would say about, um, you know, you mentioned community in here being a value, but how should we in the market value the idea of relationships? So in my research looking at religious communities that discuss international trade, one of the values they often bring up is, what does it mean to be participating in right relationships? Right relationships with the earth, with oneself, with God, um, and often you know, with other people. And in a depersonalized market, sometimes we don't see the relationships that are embedded within economic systems. And so I'd be interested in how do you think the market can or should, or where is the role of relationships uh, within that? Thank you so much for those thoughtful comments and, and questions. You know, uh, when it comes to thinking about markets, I, I'm not saying anything that's a secret here. I, I, sometimes economists and sociologists don't get along very well. And, and so it's, uh, I appreciate very much the, the, the the thrust of, of those, those questions and, and pointing to some really important uh, issues. So let me just offer some quick, quick thoughts uh, on, on those, and, and maybe I'll miss some of your, 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 your questions, uh, uh, but uh, not, not intentionally. I'll just try to hit a few, uh, hit a few things. Um, empirically, uh, it's, it, I think it's worthwhile knowing that the, the, the best evidence seems, seems to be, if you look across all growth episodes since World War II, and uh, you know, periods of, of growth and, and what was happening to the income distribution inside those periods. Uh, on average, 
uh, growth raises the income of the poor proportionally to the growth in, in national income. So if, so if national income rises by 10%, in, uh, typically uh, the growth of the, uh, the income of the poor also rises by 10%, uh, which means that uh, growth on average tends to be neutral with, uh, with respect to income distributions. Th that's important to keep in mind. We, we in the States are accustomed to thinking about uh, the, uh, and dealing with the fact that for the past 30 years our income distribution has been getting a little uh, less equal. Um, that's actually not, not the norm in economic growth. It's often the case that incomes uh, get more equal when, when, when growth occurs. So just, just something to keep in mind. Now, now when income grows and the income distribution gets, gets worse, uh, and the income of the poor doesn't, or the lowest quintile doesn't keep up with, with uh, gr the growth of national income, there are potentially harmful ramifications from that. Uh, th there are issues of, of power and influence. Uh, there's, uh, there's issues um, about uh, the, how the nature of political um, uh, parties change. Um, in, uh, and, and economists are, are just beginning to, to think, think about that. Uh, it, uh, those kinds of uh, changes can encourage some political parties to become more e extractive in their approach to economic policy and wanting to just to sort of pull pull rents, pull funds from other, from other, um, from other parties. I've, uh, without mentioning the phrase democratic capitalism, I, I, I would like to, to, to point out that in, in, uh, in, for, for me that's actually a touchstone of, of how to think about growth. The, if if the, the most stable and sustainable uh, forms of growth our, our growth that uh, is growth that comes from uh, market institutions. Well, the best uh, the best governance for market institutions is is democratic governance, uh, and in, and in fact, uh, people uh, nations as they become wealthier through uh, market oriented reforms tend to demand political kinds of reforms. Um, Democracy and, 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 the, and the market actually are, are, are twins. They're, tw they're, they're, they're twins, and, and the same arguments that work in, in favor of, of allowing people to make their ec own economic choices for themselves are, in fact, the arguments that sustain dem democratic culture and democratic politics, that, if, that uh, people, uh, in fact, are, are worthy and, uh, of, of voting and are capable of voting, are capable of thinking rationally about what's best for them. Um, so. I'd argue that as a practical matter, democratic governance provides the, the uh, and, and civil rights as we under, more or less as we understand them in the West, provide the best means of, of protecting human rights in, in growing countries and, and really overall the best way, the best way forward. Um, I should stop there, uh, I, I think. Thank, thank you though. Okay, a few more questions. With half our world living under $2 a day or less, do rich countries such as the United States have a moral responsibility to use their goods and resources to help other countries, thereby decreasing their own growth? Great, great question. And, and th th there, Oh gosh, you know this is again to think about, and you know, think about that question is is the work of uh, of a lifetime, actually, kind of like uh, thinking about growth is. Yeah. Um, yes, there is a moral obligation. It's it's definitely in the enlightened self-interest of the United States as a as a nation to uh, construct and uh, to help construct an uh, international order in which growth is possible and in which nations can interact peaceably with one one another. Uh, there's no, no question that that's in our uh, strategic uh, uh, interest, short term and long term. And I think the U.S. deserves a lot of credit for uh, historically uh, wanting to create, uh, uh, in fits and starts to be sure, uh, uh, wanting to create and more or less successfully uh, helping to create the, the, the open globalized system that we see uh, that we, and live in right now in the, in the Bretton Woods era and beyond. Uh, it's been it's been gratifying to see uh, the U.S. Uh, willing to ramp up its uh, its foreign aid. I, I'll speak personally here. Um, uh, under the Bush administration and and now continued under Obama, U.S. Uh, official foreign aid is 
is uh, substantially larger than it was in the Clinton era. The, the difficulty, of course, is, is spending that money uh, wisely and uh, figuring out the right conditions under which, to, under which to give it. But I think it's really important that the U.S. Uh, 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 offer, offer aid and, and do its best to offer it constructively. I think it's really important for, for Christians to, uh, to, to give personally. And I, 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 I can't emphasize enough how important it is for Christians to cultivate an ethic of personal generosity. Uh, wealth uh, and the fruits of wealth aren't for, just for us to, to enjoy. They're, they're means of, of being blessings to others. And, and here's a, a great point of agreement I have with uh, Ron Sider and, and others who advocate just real generous, uh, generous private, uh, private uh, private assistance and, and private aid. I hope I've spoken to some of the points in that, in that very big question. You have. Here's another one. How should we as Christians feel about our economic system reliant on interest when so much of the Old Testament commands the Israelites not to charge interest? <laughs> oh, that's a tough one. And, and um, you know, I, uh, I'm... Um, I wish I was better prepared to, to answer that, that, that question. Uh, uh, some, some thoughts on, on this. You know, um, Israel, of course, I mean, to, to hide behind a technicality, Israel, of course, was a theocracy, and we are, uh, we are, we are not. And furthermore, uh, more, more broadly, I think the call on us in, in Genesis is to think of economic life uh, prud uh, prudentially. Uh, prudence is a word that has a, a, lot, of bad, a lot of bad press, uh, um, but it means practical wisdom, and it was, in, 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 in the point of view of the early church, it was, it was, an, it was a Christian virtue. It wasn't one of the cardinal virtues, but it was an actual, straight-up Christian virtue to, to know how to act wisely in practical matters and practical affairs. And when humans are, are given dominion over, over creation, um, I, I think of that as being charged to act prudently about, uh, about the earth and about economic uh, relationships. And in a context now uh, where uh, uh, the major forms of, of capital that people own are their, are their human capital and, and, and uh, financial capital and not, and not land, um, there's a lot to be said in favor prudentially as a matter of practical wisdom of allowing of allowing uh, interest uh, payments and allowing an, uh, an interest-based uh, financial uh, system to, uh, to, to exist. I'm impressed, Stephen. Wouldn't poverty be, poverty be reduced more rapidly if we promoted moral economic growth, meaning supported factories that don't exploit workers for the first world against, against sorry, a little fuzzy here, Morally, shouldn't U.S. companies abide by U.S. labor laws in their factories abroad? You know, there's, there's competing notions of, of, of fairness here. And I can, see, uh, I can see the appeal of asking that U.S. firms are abroad pay and treat their workers at, at U.S. standards. And interestingly, in, in some respects, the actions of U.S. firms abroad or European firms abroad or, or Taiwanese firms abroad um, uh, do, in, in, in terms of the technologies that they use and the environmental controls that they use, do, they do actually typically tend to take to uh, a country they're investing uh, the standards uh, that, they, uh, that they use at home. So, you know, in a surprising way, a piece of that's uh, already, already happening. So like uh, a U.S. firm investing in, in, in China uh, will, uh, won't typically install a, a decades-old, dirty kind of uh, pollution control system in its new factory. It'll just in install what it's using in California, uh, which is a high-end, uh, sophisticated pollution control system in their, in their, in their uh, factory. But when it comes to labor, 
Uh, it's, it's not clear that that, in fact, would truly be fair to pay California wages to, the, to, to Chinese workers. Um, um, for one thing, it would mean that the firm would be hiring a lot fewer people than would otherwise be the case. Uh, foreign firms in foreign countries tend to pay a, a little bit higher than average for the uh, workers that they, they hire, a little higher than the average prevailing wage for the kinds of skills that they're, that they're hiring. So they tend to be per perceived as, as fair in the context of the labor law and the prevailing wages in their, in their countries. And uh, given uh, the, the, the mutual benefits of, of that, uh, I, I, I think that's justifiable. What is your explanation for the slowing of growth in the last 50 years in the U.S.? Yeah, I, boy, I wish I, I, I wish I knew that if I did, that'd be another book, and, and that'd be great. But uh, th this, this, is a, this is a topic of, of real, real d debate. Just, just up, the, up the road here in Northwestern University a few months ago, uh, Bob, Bob Gordon, the famous uh, macroeconomist Bob Gordon, uh, published a, a paper uh, trying to, to, to figure out what, what was behind the growth slowdown and whether it would continue. And he, he, th he, thinks, it, he thinks it will, but he, he, he argues that there's no magic bullet here, that it's a series of structural things and, 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 and what he describes as headwinds in the, in the economy. You know, a number of things really came together. The stars were really aligned in the, in the 60s and, and even into the, into the 70s, uh, but, but especially uh, 50, late 50s and, and, the, and the 60s. You had, um, you know, uh, uh, the U.S. had relatively few manufacturing competitors uh, abroad. Uh, the U.S. had uh, access to inexpensive uh, natural resources. And the U.S. was in, in the full flower of what Gordon describes as a, as a, um, a major technological uh, uh, revolution. Despite the, uh, d despite the ubiquity of the Internet revolution and the, the new technologies that are associated with the Internet, uh, Gordon argues that that hasn't yet and may never uh, deliver the kind of massive productivity gains for the economy and, and therefore growth gains that the introduction of electricity and its associated uh, uh, innovations did, and the introduction of the, of, of the initial rounds of pharma, pharmaceuticals and, um, and, and, other, uh, and other large technological innovations. The, there's a lot of other things that could be contributing to it, uh, in, including uh, government regulations, uh, our mismanaged financial system. There's a, there's a lot. If economic growth is so close, is so clearly amazing, why are so many persons, like you mentioned, constantly deriding free enterprise? I think, you know, you know, several several thoughts several thoughts on that, you know, because the free enterprise system is uh, is a free system. Uh, some people use that freedom to do bad things, and and I think that has to be acknowledged. the uh, The genius of the of the free market system is is not that it's perfect. Uh, it's, it's just that it's better than, than its alternatives and, and, and promotes certain kinds of, of, of virtues and, and, and growth and other desirable things that we, that we want. It's, but it's not, that it's, a, it's not that it's a perfect system. It holds, it holds greed in check by harnessing other people's greed uh, to, to uh, contain it. Uh, the, the baker would be thrilled to charge $20 for a loaf of bread, but can't uh, because other bakers won't, uh, will, will charge less. Uh, and so competition takes you, you know, con constrains greed. But, but since we live in a, in a market economy and see people cheating and lying and, and trying to game the, game the system, I think it's very easy for us to, to, to think of it as, as inherently flawed. What we really need to be thinking of is, is well, what, what's, what's the alternative? Um, uh, it, the, this system is, you know, has, has issues. Um, 
Um, compared to what? You know, um, once you start thinking about it in compared to what terms, capitalism looks great. D democratic capitalism looks uh, looks uh, uh, ter terrific, and the and the suite of the suite of attributes that, that come with it are actually uh, actually really uh, really uh, really desirable. Um, it, but there's an enduring challenge to make the moral case for capitalism. Uh, Arthur Brooks is, is right to, to, uh, to, to be upfront and, and, and trying to make that, that case as vigorously as he, as he does, uh, because it, every generation needs to, needs to see that and own that and understand that, understand that case. If you believe in the sustainability of economic growth, what is your take on the wealth redistribution? Um, the, the wealth redistribution, on uh, wealth redistribution? Yes. Yeah, we do, we, we do seem to be on the verge of a period of, um, of, uh, of um, uh, at least a season of, uh, of wealth uh, redistribution. Um, you know, this is, this is going to be interesting. It's kind of like a, a natural experiment. The, the, the new tax rates raise the income tax rate on the wealthiest Americans by just a small amount. It, it really, I mean, objectively speaking, it's a small amount. It's going from like 36% to 39.6%, or, you know, um, back, back to the Clinton era rate. The, uh, the, 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 the real tax increases are happening in, uh, on, on the rich, are happening in other ways. The changes in, the, in capital gains and uh, dividends and uh, the, the taxes on healthcare plans and, and those things. Uh, you know, um, we will see how much of a difference this makes for, for innovation and for small business formation. Uh, I, have my, I have my hunches. I, I, I think, I, I think it, we're going to discover it's, it, it's, uh, it's particular, this emphasis, the, the, the whole group of new taxes is going to, I think, be particularly harmful for medical innovation and, and progress in, in medical care. Uh, I'm really worried about that. Um, uh, we'll see what it does to the rest of economic life. This could be interpreted, close, interpreted as a closely related question is, what are the greatest criticisms of Keynesian economics, and is this largely the effects of Bernanke and Obama, or is it inherently with Keynesian economics? Well, you know, um, uh, <laughs> Um, oh, where, to, where to begin here? Where to begin? Uh, first of all, uh, true confessions. Ben Bernanke was my professor in grad school, and I got to tell you, I think he's. I think under the circumstances, he's he's doing about as well as a Fed as a Fed uh, chair can can do. It's. Um, uh, I, I think he's, he's trying to use monetary policy in as activist and as supportive a way as, as possible. He's. He, he, uh, I don't think for him it's it's about Keynesianism versus non-Keynesianism. I I think he is trying to keep credit flowing in the in the economy, and I think he's hoping he can pull back credit uh, before there's an inflationary explosion, and uh, he, he, we'll see if he can actually achieve that. I don't know. On the Keynesian question, you know, uh, government. I, I think it's it's worth uh, uh, noting that government spending and government borrowing really look different when you're starting from a base of having a total government debt equal to half a percent of GDP. Uh, we're not there anymore. We're at a point where total debt, uh, pri privately held and uh, held by the government, total debt is well in excess of, of GDP. And in that context, borrowing the kinds of money we're, we're borrowing right now is, is almost certainly a recipe for, for disaster. So this, is, so this isn't really so much a, a critique of, of, of Keynesianism per se, it's, 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 a, it's a critique of fiscal folly. It's, it's, uh, it's, um, it's a, a critique of, of, of recklessly uh, continuing to to to, to, bar, to borrow to borrow funds without without really having a plan to rein in spending down down the road, uh, that's that's just unwise. 
Stephen, I think that's it for our organized questions. You've assured me you're willing to entertain personal questions after you've had a few treats and a drink, so you'll be over here to talk with us. Let's give a warm expression of gratitude. Thank you, Thank you so much.